Apple Tears. If you've been watching me for a while, you know that I'm a big horror and romance fan. And I know what you're thinking. Those two genres have absolutely nothing in common. And they do, though. And it's more than you might think. The first reason they're alike is because they're flip sides of the same coin. Most people will go through their life without experiencing either extreme of horror or romance. The second thing they have in common, though, is what I'm going to talk about today. The tropes. It's been said that I'll love you forever sounds very different in a horror story than it does in a romance. And while this is technically correct, part of that is true because a lot of romance uses tropes that really belong more in horror. And it's these toxic tropes in romance that I'm going to talk about today. Now, horror has its own toxic tropes, and those will be in another video. But for now, let's look at toxic tropes in romance writing. Hi, Noveltiers. I'm Devlin Blake, novel writing and self-publishing expert, coach, published author, and former ghostwriter of 200 books. If you're writing a book, be sure to check out my Novel Writers Club at the link below. So, trigger warning. I'm going to be talking about some uncomfortable topics here. So, if you're triggered by things like abuse and assault, you might want to skip this video. But it's important to know these tropes, because unlike most animals who know things by instinct, humans learn by emulation. We imitate what we see. And if all we ever see is toxicity, we actually think that's what a relationship is supposed to look like. Really, there have been studies on this. And that's why it's up to us as writers to not encourage toxic tropes, at least not in romance. So now let's look at some of the most toxic tropes in romance. I'm gonna go straight for the jugular here with the worst trope ever in romance. And the toxic trope is that rape is sexy. A partner forcing the other to consent, whether it's wearing them down or deciding to do it without their consent or forcing them into a situation where they can't say no, is still rape. And I don't care how well it's written, it's still rape. I shouldn't need to explain why this is problematic, but based on the number of times I see it written in even newer books, apparently I do have to explain. Most often, it's a man who takes what he wants. I see this a lot, but a man who takes what he wants when it comes to sex, meaning without his partner's enthusiastic consent, is a rapist. There's no two ways about it. If your guy takes what he wants and the woman is really not on board with this, he's raping her. If she only says yes because she's afraid of him or he wore her down, then he's still a rapist. And the same is true if her body responds, but her mind is still saying no. Arousal is not the same as consent. And a lot of romance books seem to think it is. And I'm sure a lot of real rapists think it is, too. It's not. A lot of real-life victims of rape are afraid to come forward based on this harmful narrative. And there's also a lot of men who think this is a normal thing to do to women because the culture portrays a woman's no as an obstacle to overcome and not a boundary that needs to be respected. So, remember, in romance, if someone doesn't say yes, it's always a no. So make sure that she says yes in your book. In a similar vein, let's talk about how abuse is often portrayed as sexy. There's a lot of abuse tropes out there. The possessive lover, the jealous lover, the controlling lover, the stalking lover, the love bombing, the grand gesture, the ghosting, aka playing hard to get, the one who won't take no for an answer, which we just covered. And for some reason, that's all portrayed as super hot. It's not. It's psychotic. Fifty Shades of Grey is an excellent example of this. The real BDSM community preaches enthusiastic consent, which is great. But what Christian did with Anastasia most of the time was downright abusive. He disrespected her boundaries, and he didn't get the consent he should have. It's not really an exaggeration to say this is more of a law and order story than a romance, and it should have been portrayed as that. When you start to see the same tropes in horror that you see in romance, and they're portrayed as good things, then you know that's a problem. At least in horror, they're portrayed as bad things. And speaking of problems, let's look at the problem of abduction and sexual slavery in romance, because that happens quite a bit too. Specifically, it happens most often in paranormal and sci-fi romance, where the powerful non-human creature, or alien, the vampire, the shifter, or so on, has a human slave. And eventually the two fall in love. Uh, no. Human trafficking, and this really is a fictionalized version of that, is a real-world problem, and so is Stockholm Syndrome. There is no way we should be romanticizing human trafficking, regardless of whether or not it's an alien, a shifter, a vampire, or whatever. 
That's not sexy. And I get why people do this. A human needs to enter a paranormal or alien's world somehow, and they need to be able to spend time together. Abduction is the easiest way to do this, because how else is she going to get there? But how about the alien who she falls in love with rescues her from the trafficker? What if he's another slave that they somehow make it out with together? What about if they just get stranded somewhere together and there's no trafficking involved? How about just plain being straight up lost in the space? There are so many ways to play this other than relying on the highly problematic sex slave trope. A similar trope is the power imbalance one. This is where someone, usually a man, dates an employee or someone in a lower power position. Now I know what you're going to say. What about prince romances or what about billionaire romances? Well, there are ways to do this without the power imbalance being present. For example, a CEO and an ordinary worker of a different company. Or a prince and a commoner that isn't from his kingdom. Or how about a billionaire and a subcontractor? Because these powerful people aren't directly in control of the future of the other person, the power imbalance does not come into play. You'll notice that nearly every prince story revolves around a prince and usually an American woman. There's a reason for that, and it's not just because Americans make up the majority of the market who watch those movies. It's because she's not under direct rule of the monarchy. It's like, yes, there's a class imbalance, but there's no imbalance of power. She's free to date him or not without repercussions. Whereas a citizen of his realm probably doesn't feel free to do that. If your character can't walk away without doing damage to their safety or career, it's just a different type of coercion being portrayed as sexy. So the next toxic trope is, they've been friends for years, but they've only fallen in love now. This is problematic for two reasons. The first reason is actually from a storytelling standpoint. The meet cute, where two people meet for the first time, is something the readers really want to see. But this trope removes it entirely, which leaves the readers feeling like your story is lacking something. But let's talk about the toxic part of this trope. Why are they falling in love now, of all things? If it's because one had a glow up, lost weight, put on muscle, or turned really good looking in some other way, that just portrays the other partner as incredibly shallow, and that's not a good look on anyone. It also perpetuates the nice guy stereotype, reinforcing that if a guy hangs around a woman long enough and keeps putting in kindness coins, eventually the sex will fall out. And that's very problematic. This is why real guys don't learn to take no for an answer and why they feel so entitled. So let's nip that in the bud right now. Another problematic trope is the good girl, bad boy one. This one isn't intrinsically problematic like the others, but it is often problematic in the way it's portrayed. Usually the bad boy is an asshole, not a good person. Again, this is romanticizing abuse, which is something we want to avoid. However, your bad boy doesn't have to be an asshole to be bad. Maybe he's just out of step with society because he's genuine. Maybe he's a hacker with a reputation, but not an asshole. Maybe he got into some trouble in his youth and has reformed, but no one will give him a chance. There are so many directions you can take this trope in, so this one doesn't actually have to be problematic unless you write it that way. On the other hand, an intrinsically problematic trope is that she's dating an asshole and the good guy is going to break them up trope. You've seen this one before. And here's why this one is always problematic. One, either the guy she's dating isn't actually an asshole and your male just wants it for himself, which makes him the asshole instead. Or two, she has no issues being with an asshole, which brings her character into question. You remember how your parents always told you you're judged by the company you keep? This is doubly true for the people you date. If she's dating an asshole, it's because she doesn't have a problem with his behavior. It means she's an asshole, too. I can hear you now, though. But what if she's in an abusive relationship and she needs help getting out? Well, that's a different story. Like, a completely different story. A different genre entirely. If a woman is in a relationship like that, a new boyfriend is not going to fix her problems. In fact, she should not jump to one guy from another until she gets her head back together. Abuse can really mess you up, and showing her jumping from one guy to another so fast just shows she doesn't feel complete on her own and would likely go with any guy who just showed up. That's not a look you want for your heroine. That's pretty messed up, actually. That woman needs therapy, not a new boyfriend by the end of the book. She wouldn't get out of an abusive relationship unscathed, and there's just no way to turn that into a romance without it being problematic. 
If anything, the new guy's taking advantage of her low self-esteem. Now let's look at one that's a more popular trope, but also intrinsically toxic. The love triangle. It's usually played as a woman deciding between two or more guys. Now I did want to say this is different from reverse harem, because in reverse harem, she's not actually deciding between two or more guys, she's keeping them both. But in any situation where she is choosing between them, all that proves is that she doesn't really love either guy enough. Also, it's unlikely that two guys would be monogamous to her when she's not really being monogamous to them. They'd be dating other women too, and likely not stick around for her. The only time I've ever seen this work is when the woman picks a third guy who was introduced later. This works because if she was truly in love with either of these two guys, there wouldn't be a second guy. She would just be one guy that she was in love with. So now let's talk about the two-person love triangle. This is also known as the Superman triangle, or as I like to call it, the gem triangle. Anyone else remember that show, Gem and the Holograms? Jerrica had an alter ego named Jem who was outspoken, confident, and everything that Jerrica wasn't. And thanks to a clever disguise, no one made the connection that Jem and Jerrica were actually the same person. No one, including Rio, who was Jerrica's boyfriend. He found himself drawn to Jem, and even though he tried to fight it, he couldn't. This was because down deep, his soul knew that she was the same person. But his consciousness didn't know that, and it pretty much tore him apart. The show ended without him ever finding out that Jem and Jericho were the same person, but if he did, he'd likely feel betrayed and manipulated. This kind of relationship, where one character is actively tricking and lying to their partner, can't last very long once the truth is known. Trust has been broken. Now I know what you're going to say. It works in the superhero comics, like with Lois and Superman and Spider-Man and Mary Jane, but those aren't actual romances. They're not written to be romances, they just have a romantic subplot. And unless you're writing about superheroes specifically, in which case you're not writing a romance, this is a trope to avoid. So our final toxic trope is the playboy. A man who's afraid of commitment doesn't wake up one day and turn monogamous forever. Sure, he might say it, and at the time he might even mean it, but it's not going to last long because it's not who he is. Eventually, he's going to go back to his philandering ways unless there's a significant amount of character growth between the start of the book and the finish of the book. Finding the right woman is not a substitute for working on himself, and it's not going to work long term. So that is the final toxic trope I'm going to talk about today. There are actually a lot more toxic tropes. I actually had a list of about 25 toxic tropes, but I know you don't want to be here all day. So that's about it for now, even though I have a lot more to say on the topic. And I might even do a part two if you tell me you want one down in the comments. And remember, if you need help writing your book, check out the Novel Writers Club at the link below. Please like and subscribe for more videos on writing and publishing your novel in this brave new world. Until next time, this is Devlin Blake saying right on.